Good morning, I'm Pastor Danny Deeth, and I want to invite you to this special summer worship celebration. Ready Vacation Bible School friends? One, two, three. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Yay! The first lesson this morning is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. I know what it is to have a little. I know what it is to have plenty. And in any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry. Having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to be with you again. I look around and see familiar faces. Those apparently didn't dislike my last sermon so much, you came back. So it's good to see you. Aaron led into my sermon so beautifully, so thank you. And he thankfully left out the one verse I'm going to be preaching on. Otherwise, I could just now do the benediction. <laughs> but let me set the, sto the, the story a bit before I read our text, our uh, scripture for this morning. Moses has gone to Mount Sinai. He stayed there longer, as Aaron said, than the, the Israelites had expected. And they became anxious, and they began grumbling, complaining. And in Moses' absence... Aaron takes gold, Moses' brother, and creates this calf. And as Moses is coming down the mountain, his first lieutenant, Joshua, who later will be his successor, is waiting at the foot of the mountain. And we're going to pick up the story when Joshua speaks to Moses. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, it isn't the sound of victory. It's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf they had made and burned it in the fire, and then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, Why did these people do, What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil? They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. This is the word of the Lord. Let me set the background of this story, the context even more. Most of you know the story. Moses has an older brother, Aaron. He's three years older. And Moses is a child who was raised in the courts of Pharaoh. And Aaron is raised with his Jewish or his Israelite family. When they get older... Moses, because of a crime that he's committed, must go into the wilderness, and he stays there 40 years. And then at that magnificent and momentous moment, he runs into the burning bush, this bush that burns and burns and burns, but isn't consumed. But if you listen carefully to that story, God says to Moses, I want you to go back 
to lead the people of Israel at the end of their 400 years of bondage into the promised land. And Moses said, I can't do it. I'm not man enough. I'm not eloquent enough. He begins to make excuses for why he can't do what God has called him to do. And when he says, I'm not eloquent enough, God says, I've already sent Aaron, your brother, to find you, and the two of you will go back, and Aaron will be your spokesperson. So our first real encounter with Aaron is when he is now on his way to and soon meets his brother. Together they go back to, the, to Egypt, and Aaron throws down in the court of Pharaoh his shepherd's staff, and it turns into a snake. And he grabs it and snaps it, and it goes back into being a rod, his shepherd's staff. And Aaron accompanies Moses through ten plagues that include the river, of the, the river Nile turned to blood, flies, gnats, one by one. And one by one, Pharaoh relents to let the people go to the promised land, and then he relents on that and then lets them go. And Aaron has witnessed and in fact been Moses' partner in ministry through all of this. And Moses and Aaron lead the people out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage, to the Red Sea where God miraculously delivers them. And then into the wilderness where God miraculously provides for them food and water where there is none. And then we encounter this experience where Moses goes up on the mountain and in his absence, Aaron, who has watched, he's heard the story of the burning bush, he's watched the, the staff turn to a serpent and back, he's witnessed God's delivery through ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea and sustaining them in the wilderness, and now in the midst of their anxiety because they don't know where Moses is gone and when, if ever, he'll come back, Aaron relents and creates a golden calf, and the people begin to worship it. And if you went back earlier in this chapter, you'd find Aaron's telling of the story isn't exactly right. Because if you read a bit earlier, he forms this calf, but when he's confronted by Moses in one of the most ironic and in some ways absurdly humorous passages in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, when confronted, Aaron says... I don't know what happened. I threw in gold, out came a calf. This is like a student saying, I turned in a blank sheet for a test and the teacher gave me back a hundred. I don't know how that could possibly have happened. Or, for weeks, months, and years, I was unfaithful to my spouse. I don't understand how I ended up with a bad marriage. The message today is on leadership. And here we encounter two potentially great leaders. Moses, to this day, viewed as one of the great leaders in all of human history. And his brother, who has the opportunity to do precisely the same thing, to provide great leadership. Oh, I don't know what happened, Moses. I threw in gold, and out came a calf. The refusal of leadership. The encounter between two brothers one of whom who's been on the mountain and come down with the written Ten Commandments, and the other who after a little over a month yields to the will of the people and sacrifices his commitment to God and his willingness to lead the people of Israel. So what do we learn about leadership in the encounter of these two men? And why am I talking about that today? Because it is my opinion that the greatest crisis in our country today is we do not have enough and we don't have strong enough leaders. We are bereft of enough leaders and strong enough leaders. 
I am not speaking just to politicians today when I use the term leader. They are leaders. But I'm also talking about school principals and pastors and parishioners. I'm talking about school administrators and teachers. I'm talking about business owners and those who manage others and those who supervise others. I'm talking about parents and grandparents who have the responsibility, the God-given responsibility to set an example, a godly example of those people they either supervise or parent or grandparent. I believe the worst crisis in our country today is we don't have enough leaders and we don't have enough strong leaders. And we find the reasons for that in this particular passage. When Moses comes down expecting that his brother will step up in his absence and provide godly leadership and his brother collapses with the wonderful explanation I don't know, I threw in gold, out came a calf. What's different about these two men? They're both Israelites. They both are acquainted with the story of the burning bush. They both have witnessed 10 plagues and God delivering the people of Israel. They both have witnessed the crossing of the Red Sea. They both have seen God's miraculous intervention time and time and time again to lead them through the promised land. What happened to Aaron? Oh, my brother Aaron, how could you have seen everything I've seen? How could you see every way God has led and delivered us and be such a miserable example of a leader that you led the people into sin? Here's where they are different. And here's where we learn the lesson of being a great parent, being a wonderful great-grandparent, being a supervisor, being a teacher, being an administrator, being a politician, being a pastor, being on a committee that leads the church. One of these men said, my relationship with God precedes my relationship with the people. Moses comes down from the mountain and he says, I have spent my time in the presence of God and therefore I can lead the people. And Aaron says, and I've spent the time in the presence of the people and I'm yielding my commitment to God. Great leaders put God before the people. And that is true of parents, it is true of managers in business, it is, in, it is true of politicians, it is true of all great leaders. They put faith above the opinion of the people. So Aaron has spent his time listening to the grumbling of the people, the murmuring of the people. And one of the things we always know is in the absence of a great leader, the followers will become anxious. They'll become, we don't know what's happening. We're not sure what to do. And Aaron yields to the will of the people. Why? Well, my major in college was sociology. And as a good sociologist, I could say peer pressure. The pressure of all of those hundreds and hundreds of people just wore Aaron down. It was peer pressure. Perhaps true. My background in psychology, I could say maybe it was inferiority. Maybe Aaron felt bad having walked so long in the shadow of his younger brother. And there was a touch of sibling rivalry here. And in his brother's absence, he thought, now I can assume leadership. Maybe it was peer pressure. Maybe it was some desire to succeed because of some degree of inferiority. We know when people are anxious, what happens in the brain? The brain begins to cause us to have the fight, flight, freeze response when we get anxious, when we get uptight, when we feel confronted, when we feel we're in the midst of some sort of challenge. So maybe Aaron's brain suddenly switched into, I can't fight all these people. 
And I can't run, so I'll just freeze and yield to them. Perhaps true. Peer pressure, inferiority, the way the brain is structured. But Moses, when he looked in the eyes of his brother, asked that profound question. For Moses was not satisfied with the name peer pressure or inferiority or the way my brain functions when I'm anxious. Aaron looked at him and said, why did you lead people into sin? What happened in this passage was not peer pressure, inferiority, or the anxiety of the brain. It was Aaron led the people into that age-old term that none of us likes to hear, and yet we all live with sin. So what was the sin? The simple first answer Worshiping a calf instead of God. But we have to look at the story a little more in depth. It wasn't just worshiping a calf instead of God. It was that. It was worshiping the created rather than the Creator. I find it absolutely humorously and tragically absurd that the people in the, in the wilderness would make a calf, they'd give their jewelry, their rings, their necklaces, all their golden jewelry to Aaron. He makes the calf, and then they bow down and worship that which they gave to him. They worshiped the created not the Creator. And they looked at that calf that was made out of their own jewelry, and now they're bowing down to it and singing triumphantly about the wonderful leader they have. And they've forgotten the one who delivered them from 400 years of bondage and slavery the one who helped them cross the Red Sea and opened and parted it so they could walk on dry land. They worshipped the created, not the Creator. Was that the sin? It certainly was. It was indeed. They worshipped the calf. They worship the created rather than the Creator. But it was also the sin of uncertainty. It is true, when the leader is taken away, the people become anxious. And as opposed to turning to God at that point and saying, God has led us this far into and will lead us further. And we can trust God. They had to resolve their anxieties, and Aaron assisted mightily in that. I threw in gold, out came a calf. Great leaders put God before the voice of the people. Great leaders realize you worship the Creator, not the created. Great leaders live with a motto. It is better to fail in that which will ultimately succeed than to succeed in that which will ultimately fail. I remember the year 1966. I lived in Birmingham. And I sat in a church state convention one evening, sitting in the choir, as I always sang in the choir, the volunteer choir, any chance I could. And that night, you could count them, seven. I could see it all from where I was sitting up with the choir. Seven African Americans made their way in 
and sat in the middle of our convention. They stood when we stood. They bowed their heads and prayed when we prayed. They sang the same songs we were singing when we sang. They listened to the same messages we listened to or the message that night. And at the end, they got up and very quietly and graciously exited with a few, a very few people shaking hands with them. And I could see it. I could see it all. And the next day in a business meeting, one of the ministers of the state stood up and he introduced a resolution that the board of trustees of the state should prohibit African Americans, though he didn't use the word African American. If you lived in Alabama in the 60s, you know what word he used. That they should prohibit them from coming to worship. And the vote passed with a huge majority to bar those people from coming and the board of trustees to keep them from doing so. And the parliamentarian of that meeting then stood up and walked to the microphone. And he said, I rule it out of order because the trustees have no such authority according to our bylaws. And the minister who made the first resolution said, then I want to make a resolution that the Board of Christian Education keep them from coming to our assembly. It was voted on, passed with a good majority, big majority. Then the parliamentarian stood up and he said, I rule it out of order because according to the bylaws, the Board of Christian Education has no such authority. And so the minister a third time stood up and introduced the resolution. And he simply said, I think we should all take a stand that we are opposed to black people coming to our assembly, our segregated assembly. And the parliamentarian, before it passed, stood up a third time and walked to the microphone. And he said, I rule it out of order. I was sitting way back in the back row. It was a heartbreaking experience. For me, it was. And somebody from the assembly said to the parliamentarian from the floor, why are you ruling it out of order? And the parliamentarian said, because it's wrong. Because it's wrong. Here was a man who was willing to take the lead and stand against that which he knew to be wrong because he believed it is better to fail in a cause that will ultimately succeed than to succeed in a cause that will ultimately fail. And this day, if I go to the Alabama assembly of my denomination, they have an integrated assembly. Why? I think part of it is because in the mid-60s, one minister was willing to go to the microphone and speak against the racism of the people that were there and say, it's just wrong. Moses that day said, Aaron, you have succeeded you have succeeded. But you've succeeded in a cause that will ultimately fail because God's call is for the people of Israel to get to the promised land and you and all of those dissenters may not get there, but you're not going to keep God from achieving that which God has called the people to do. It is better to fail in a cause that will ultimately succeed than to succeed in a cause that will ultimately fail. And Moses knew that. When he came down, he recognized that as a leader, he had not prepared the people to live with his absence for a while. He had failed. But he also knew that he'd failed in a cause that was God's cause that was ultimately going to succeed. And that gave him courage. The last difference that I'll talk about, the difference between Moses and Aaron, great leaders put God first, people second. Great leaders worship the Creator, not the created. Great leaders are willing to sacrifice losing in the present for a cause that will ultimately succeed. And last... Great leaders stay the course even when they stand alone. 
Why? Because they know they're on the path of God's calling. And each and every one of you here today, and each of those who is viewing with whatever TV or platform you're viewing, in some way, you're a leader. What is a leader? This morning at 6.30, I went for a walk. And I deliberately, in the course of that walk, stopped three times and looked behind me. And I looked back to see if there was anyone behind me. And I discovered in walking this morning, I am, was not a leader. How did I know? Because I didn't have any followers. When you are leading and no one is following, you're just out taking a walk. One, leaders are willing to stand alone on their convictions if necessary. And two, they take the long view. Moses realized that day, this journey is not over. So whether you are a politician or a pastor, whether you're a parent or a grandparent, whether you own a small business or a manager, whether you're a teacher or an administrator, or whether you're a next door neighbor, a leader is someone who influences others. And in some way, you influence other people. All leaders do is influence. But they influence on the basis of God's guidance and direction. They make sure their time with God is a first priority and their time with people a second one. They don't mind risking a short-term failure for a long-term success. And they remember, it's God's leadership. As the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament, we're called as stewards of God's grace. I'll close with a, te with a reference. If you were to read carefully in the New Testament, you would find the Apostle Paul had a friend. His name was Demas. And Demas is only mentioned by name three times in the Scripture. The first time, Paul says, my co-worker Demas, a partner in ministry, my co-worker. The second time, Demas is mentioned, it's just his name, and Demas, with no adjectives, no descriptors. And the third time Demas is mentioned, the Scripture says, and Demas has abandoned me, having loved the world. Co-worker, just a name, and now a forgotten person. Because Demas was a great starter. He was really good out of the gate. When the gate opened on that first straightaway, he was right there at the head of the pack. But as he rounded the far turn, coming back to the finish line, Demas wasn't to be seen. We're called to be leaders, and leaders not only are good out of the gate, they're also strong at the finish line. Amen.